Yeah, Chad, thank you very much. Um, if you could go back to one of your, your architecture slides for me real quick. Yeah, I, I think what's key here is the, the, the point of this is out of the IMW comes the location, which we typically uh, ingest and present into our Esri-based Compass Track Viewer for users. But now, in addition to that, LDE is sharing that GPS location out of the mobile, Motorola radios into TAC, which means you've expanded your command and control, not only to people with smartphones, but people carrying Motorola radios and have a more common operational picture to work off of. And I, I think, Chad, that's really powerful. I don't think that's being done by many people yet. And you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I think that's the power of the combination of the Compass TAC connector into the TAC server and what the user would see on, the, on that side. Uh, down, a, a future developed for, my, for us is we're gonna take the location of the TAC devices into LD and out to Compass Track and have a two-way connector uh, later this year. So I, I think that's the key to be able to bring Motorola into the TAC environment in a common operational picture. And Chad and John, if you want to speak to that, but I, I think that's the, really the power of what we're talking about here. Yeah, that that is uh, that's true, Brent. That that is the that is the aim is to get as as many user devices into that operational picture, so that um, the supervisory people, the incident commander type people, know wh where their assets are in real time, and can uh, I think as as Jimmy was saying earlier, uh, Chief Isaacs, it's um, it's all about efficiency. It's about getting those having an effective search and rescue operation, being able to do a grid search, move quickly. And, and because in, in the business of first response, it's not minutes, it's seconds that uh, determine the outcome. Yep. So now, and if we could go back to one of Chief Isaac's slides too, um, which shows, uh, go back where we show Compass Respond, sort of the architecture there for me and why, why you're finding that. The other thing too, Chief, I don't know if you've used it, but there's also geofencing in Compass Respond as well. Have you had a chance to use that feature in Compass Respond? I have used it some, uh, you know, on, honestly, my familiarity with the Compass Track product, product for the past six or seven years, I have a tendency to go back to what I use the most, unfortunately. Yeah. So I, I just to just to explain the workflow a bit, you can take this device with it runs met Esri uh, back in uh, runtime software on it with maps that you load yourself for your area of interest where you're going to be working, whether it's a wildland fire or in the case of Chief Isaacs, he's got his whole area around Boone that he has loaded preloaded in there with the GIS data he has, takes it to the field puts the master radio plugged into it and hands out radios to the rest of the team or if they have radios that are configured to the rest of the team. That's the jump and go tactical use of this system. Now, what it becomes even more powerful is with the uh, broadband card in the system or a broadband modem attached to the system enables that to go back through a connector into his compass track system and headquarters. Is that right, Chief? And yes, that's, cor that's correct. That's that's what we've done. And uh, that's that's been a tremendous asset uh, to do that. Uh, we have gone as far as we had a search in an area, didn't have broadband internet, and simply take the laptop in the living room of the house where they let us work out of the living room or the kitchen table whatever, and connect to their local internet, whether it be by LAN or Wi-Fi, and able to pump that data straight out. Yeah, so it can act standalone, or if you have connectivity, you can bring it back and include it in the mix with the, with the command center. Uh, another operation, and John, you're gonna have to help me with this one, is you have a mobile command center, a, a big uh, suburban or some other type of vehicle, that you would have Compass Respond set up in. And then you could use a Motorola repeater that's a higher powered repeater, right, John, on that command yeah, system? Yeah, correct. And, and, and uh, during uh, 
Chief Isaac's uh, presentation, he had alluded to the fact that in some of their vehicles, they use another product that I'm very familiar with called the Futurecom DVRS. And that is a, a vehicular repeater that now is um, expanding the kit coverage and capability around, around that command center vehicle. As you, and as you describe it, it could be a, it could be a, a large SUV. It could be a mobile command center for that matter. And, um, and that, and that is, uh, is, is really, uh, I think a game changer when you're off the grid, if you can introduce that repeater device, um, you can, you've really got a, a single channel conventional radio system running right now. And, and um, so wherever you position that repeater device, uh, you know, in relationship to the active incident that you're working, you can, uh, you can get some pretty impressive coverage, I, I would say. Um, Chief Isaac, so is, is that pretty much your experience with it? Yes, that's correct. Basically, what we have is within the, the DVR configuration, uh, we, we've got it configured for uh, with the data profile and everything assigned to it, where we can use the DVR also if we need more range. Yeah. You know, it's a, it's a, you know, I mean, there's so many ways to approach the environment of, you know, now tech, technology is at the point where now they're, in addition to portable repeaters, there are portable LTE devices, there are portable Wi Fi setups. But I think that um, the, the one thing, and I think it's why people, gravitate kind of back to their roots and 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 rely on uh, land mobile radio is it's simple it, you know it's fairly simple to set this up and 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 get a, a good result and get that result quickly and, and, and get the mission underway so i um i think with a repeater this is a, it's really an unbeatable uh, system for its simplicity well and uh somebody I didn't even have to prep for this question because somebody asked a question. I don't have who, who asked on, on the, as an anonymous attendee, asked if there's a SAT backhaul capability. And uh, the example I would give there, a couple was if you're in a wildland fire environment out in the middle of the West somewhere fighting a fire and you have a command center with a SAT backhaul in, you could be running this with repeaters on mountaintops to radios and then do a SAT backhaul back to command center in Boise or wherever, or California, wherever it can be done. The other nice thing about having that connectivity uh, with the broadband to the hardened device to the laptop is now you can bring in uh, different map layers or themes from ArcGIS. And those themes may be the latest upload of remote sense data for uh, heat hotspots, uh, fire lines, thermal data that would be collected as part of an aerial that could be loaded into ArcGIS. And, and just by having it in the map layers brought in, you can almost bring it in real time with connectivity. Or you can pass the file over somehow, then load it on the hardened device. The, the, the mobile command center there would compass track, or would compass respond, not to confuse people. But then you would be able to see the, the progression of the fire as data is available and be able to uh, locate and, and respond to it with flights and or your individuals out in the field with the currently available. So I hope that answers your question on the SAT backhaul. Uh, if, if we have a, a, a modem with it connected uh, and if we don't have the interface, we could, we, one of the things we do a lot of is divine and interfaces as you can see between devices. Um, another question chief that was asked was accuracy. When you're doing search and rescue with the Motorola radios, you know, and, and I think your response was you've seen good accuracy. Can you expand upon that a little bit when you see the location on your people out looking for folks? As a general rule, we've not had any accuracy issues. Uh, it may not be an exact pinpoint within 10 feet, uh, some of the heavy forested areas, especially in areas uh, with a lot of rhododendron and mountain laurel, it may get to a 30 foot accuracy level, but uh, we've pretty much consistently always been able to get a GPS lock. Okay. Well, I as, as a, a GPS surveyor for many years, I can tell you trees are columns of water and trees uh, will um, degrade or uh, 
attenuate RF signal. So when you get in heavy tree can canopy, it can definitely affect your position. Uh, also, if you get blindsided in a canyon on the south side, typically in this part of the world, uh, you may lose some radio, some GPS satellite coverage, which may affect your position as well. Uh, I, th I think it really comes down to you're walking with a radio and you're looking around searching for stuff or you may have metal detectors or whatever you're using. You have a and 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 GPS accuracy accuracy is typically six feet autonomous without being corrected in good view of the sky and good feet up. So, you know, if you can see around you in that area, I would think, Chief, you, you know, you're getting a good view. You're not looking straight down maybe for shell casings or something like that. But uh, if you're looking for a body or something like that, if you know that. The other thing I would add to, uh, and John, you can help me with this. I, I think what we're looking at on maximum cadence to these systems is around 30 seconds. Is that correct? Yeah, pretty, pretty much. That's, that's where we would generally uh, uh, set the radios. Now, I think, uh, I, and I would defer to to uh, Chief Isaacs on the, um, as the number of radios, I, I, I think of a typical end use of our system may have, uh, you know, as few as a dozen radios on it. And Chief, I, you know, you could certainly comment if, if you have experience using it with a larger number, say 20, 25, 30 radios or something. In that what, what we found, especially with Compass Track, um, on our server-based system, the five-minute interval, because it's going to fluctuate from seven or eight portables to 20 portables, uh, the five-minute probably works fine for that. The only issue that I have saw, I put as many as 15 or 16 radios on Compass Respond. The 30-second interval is probably a little tight. We bumped it out to a minute, and it seems to work fine with the dozen or so radios uh, without any issue. Uh, yeah. The nice thing is, if it becomes a problem, you can always bump it out to the 300-second range or something along that. And if you've got a question on an individual radio, you've got the ability to poll that individual radio. Uh, that's a tremendous asset with that system is being able to poll the individual radio. Yeah. Uh, like that, but you know, yeah, the thirty I, I, second was probably a little tight. Yeah, no, I, I agree, and I, I, that's why I asked for your real world experience. I think that um, I think your your point is dead on. That it, the fact that you can pull a radio whenever you want to, and look and uh, locate that individual, and the fact that you can find last known location whenever you want to. If you have a radio that just goes completely off, you can do a, a find. Uh, request and you'll interrogate the database, you know, where the radio was and, and when it was there, it's last known location, which can prove also to be very helpful. An another very important feature that's very important to us is that emergency button, when the radio emergency button is pushed, it jumps in front of everything and gives an immediate location. Right, guys? Yep. yep. So every motor roll radio has an emergency button. As soon as that responder or field asset pushes that button, it sounds an alarm and the system puts it out there. I uh, had another question, which I know Haas Saud, who's our chief system engineer and John will love. Does the system work on conventional VHF non-trunk radio? Yes, we're working on conventional non-trunk now. That's a non-trunk yeah. system. Yeah, absolutely. As long as it's P25 or PAX data, it's fine. Yep. That's that's the main issue. It, it's, it, it, be, it needs to be a digital radio system, but it certainly can be both flavors. Conventional is fine, trunking. And in fact, I guess just to clarify a little bit, when I was talking through the system diagram and I had mentioned the intelligent middleware server, the IMW that Motorola provisions, that is on a smart zone astro trunking system. And uh, when you see it in pure conventional mode, there's two ways to approach it. You can approach it from a donor radio, which we've been illustrating during our conversations when you're pure, pure off the grid. Um, or you can actually, on a Motorola conventional core system, you can, I, you can configure and add an IMW server to a conventional core if, if that was desirable. And is that what our park service customers do, or how are they doing it today with their own? Um, one, uh, you know, uh, 
One of them absolutely is a conventional system with core. In fact, I think a couple of them right now that have migrated to that. And then we have some that are purely using the, uh, the gateway radio concept to gather the data. One question also, how can we pull a, how can we pull a conventional radio? But I think you've answered that question, but yeah, the, the functionality, frankly, is there, right? In both cases, when we, uh, on a trunking system, when you hit poll, your that request is going through the intelligent middleware server out into the Astro trunking system, grab that radio and tell it to send its location back. When you're doing it in a conventional environment, the, the poll command that comes from our system is just heard by that radio on that channel. And it, it responds in a, I would say, Jimmy, what is it was two seconds? Maybe and you have that location back. Now, John, can you see the other, the next question about TAC and interface with Apex radios? I can read. Is there a plan to provide a cable that could connect a Motorola P25 APX series to TAC devices to be able to transmit, receive COTS and uh, PLI data? Um, not, not at this time. Um, we, uh, we, you know, right now we are, we are providing purely, we are providing the location data that we have in our server. That is what we are providing when we connect to the TAC server. So then, so right now, what, uh, what we are providing is the location of that LMR asset. And, but we are, we are interested in, in, uh, have already begun conversations with uh, TAC end users, especially amongst our DOD customers about, um, you know, futures they'd like to see. So um, that's not available at this time, but if you would like to um, say, you know, we're happy to have that question sent along to us. If we have your identification, we'll get back to you. Okay, I don't see any more questions up right now. I'd, I'd just like to end with one more comment. As an Esri business partner for 24 years, everything we do is about incorporating GIS data specific to your mission into the application, just not using canned off the shelf maps. That's where our clients and our customers make the most use of our system. So if you have GIS data, that you want incorporated into your mission plan. If you want to integrate with all kinds of commercially available through ArcGIS Online data, we can help you do that. And then we have our Compass Data sister company that does GIS development that can help and helps a lot of our customers at Compass.com, frankly, pull the maps together that make sense for your mission, so. So, John, are you seeing this next comment from uh, National Park Service? Um, yeah, you know, I'm, I'm trying to see where the, this Go is. Go down to Q&A and click on it. Okay, this. hang on. Yeah, that, yeah, I just got a note from Dan. Um, this is really, really interesting. And, and but I have to preface my comment about this by, by uh, certainly letting everyone know that uh, Dan is a, what I would certainly call a Motorola slash uh, compass uh, track power user. He does things that a lot of people don't think of doing. And is uh, in, in, in this particular case, he had just, he had just messaged me about this, that he, he is using, and this is kind of interesting, he's using the distance travel trigger in the IMW. So stationary radios aren't even reporting. So he's he's happy if they're if they're not moving. I know where they are. Got their last known location, right? And uh, and then anybody gets up and moves, they start reporting. So it's uh, very interesting, Dan. Thank you for that comment. And it's a much more efficient way to use wireless bandwidth, also. Yeah. Okay. Well, uh, I want to thank uh, Chief Isaac and Chad for your input today, and John. Yeah. And uh, it's your sharing of what you're doing is, is so valuable to everybody in this community. I, I want to thank you very much. Uh, the recordings of these sessions will be available in the next couple of days at compass.university on the compass and also on the compass.com website. If you'd like to share or want to have a chance to come back, 
I would encourage anybody out there that has additional questions after we quit or we're gone or you want to see a more focused live demo on what you're doing to please reach out to us at support at compasscom.com or contact us uh, via phone. We still answer the phone, believe it or not, around here. And we would love an opportunity to discuss your application, what you're doing. And if we can't help you, point you in the right direction to get the support you need. So again, thank you very much. Appreciate your time today and have a great rest of your week.